Okay, we're back to dig a little bit deeper into the history of our understanding of vitamin C as a molecule and from a scientific perspective. Um, Well-known Teesider Captain James Cook was born in what one recent biographer described as a mud hut in Martin. Just a few miles from where I'm writing this is often credited with good on-board practices in the prevention of scurvy. During his Pacific voyages, Cook was supplied with 40 bushels of malt, a uh, thousand pounds of portable soup, that's about 500 kilograms, vinegar, mustard, wheat, to weather with proper quantities of sauerkraut, which is what you'd expect it to be, and rub. Now, rub was a concentrated form of lemon juice made by evaporating it over fire until it acquires the consistency of a syrup. This prevents fermentation, but unfortunately probably destroys all the vitamin C. Uh, so far, his crew did come down with scurvy, though non-fatally. Uh, as mentioned before, William Lind was probably a more important figure in our understanding of this issue. Uh, Lind's was one of the first scientific trials in the effect of diet on a specific medical condition, something which is a big deal these days, of course. He largely ignored at the time. Uh, people claimed he was confused and had unscientific arguments. And we mentioned before elixir of vitriol, which is dalosulfuric acid, to which was added apparently alcohol, ginger and cinnamon. Presumably you make it taste a bit nicer. Whether it did or not, I have really no idea. Um, as might be expected from our perspective, those concoctions that contain some vitamin C were seen to show some antiscorbutic effect. Again, it is important to point out that this was new knowledge at the time. Vitamin C still had not been even discovered. Um, Forty years after Lynn's original publication, the Royal Navy adopted the idea, so eliminating scurvy from among its sailors. Um, we mentioned in the previous lecture the fact that British sailors were frequently referred to as limeys by Americans because of their consumption of lime juice. Um, it took up to the First World War before the Merchant Navy came on board. Uh, it's worth pointing out that during the 18th and 19th century, there were many problems with food quality. Uh, this was one, this is a quote from a part of a public spat between W.B. Harrison, who claimed lime juice on the merchant ship St. Andrew's Castle, which had five cases of severe scurvy on board, was of high quality. And a chap called Leach, who rebutted this in the Times uh, in 1866. Okay, so the discovery of vitamin C. Uh, mentioned this before, but it's worth, it's worth reiterating just as an introduction. Historically, land scurvy and sea scurvy were often considered to be different diseases. Outbreaks were more frequent and severe at sea, but in both cases, vitamin C deficiency was the issue. Um, medieval life was undoubtedly hard, especially for peasant classes, and a range of lifestyle factors probably enhanced the likelihood of vitamin C deficiency developing because they increased the rate at which vitamin C was used. Uh, again, I think we've seen this before. Um, Muslin bread is made from a mixture of rye and wheat flour, and after a poor harvest when grain was in short supply, people uh, forced to include beans, peas, and even acorns in their bread. Now, the first two were uh, often in med many modern breads, perhaps not acorns as such. Uh, it also mentions peace there, or peace pottage or peas po porridge, a uh, baked vegetable product which mainly consists of split yellow or carlin peas, water, salt, spices and was often cooked with a bacon or ham joint. Um, this diet is equivalent to about 3,000 calories a day which is more than modern recommendations but may well have been too low for a medieval peasant's lifestyle. Come spring, plants would start to flower. Among them common purslane, an annual succulent and also Elecampane, also known as horsehail, a uh, perennial composite plant found in many parts of Great Britain, uh, which ranges across Central and Southern Europe and Asia as far as towards the Himalayas. Now, these were quite high in vitamin C, so people would eat them and it would alleviate the symptoms of, la of, of land scurvy. Uh, okay, so the scientific discovery of vitamin C starts with Axel Holst. He was a Norwegian professor of hygiene and bacteriology at the University of Oslo. Host and paediatrician Theodore Froek became interested in a disease called Ship Berry Berry, which affected the crews of sailing ships and showed a similarity to scurvy. They suspected a nutritional deficiency and used guinea pigs as an experimental model. This was lucky because the animal cannot synthesize vitamin C. Uh, so this was the first use of a guinea pig as a guinea pig. 
Now this one looks quite happy, surrounded by green plants full of vitamin C. They found the guinea pigs developed distinctly scurvy-like symptoms when fed a diet consisting of various types of grain, which were probably low in vitamin C. And these symptoms were prevented or reduced when the diet was supplemented with known anti-scurvy erratics, that is to say things which prevent or reduce the rate of scurvy, like fresh cabbage or lemon juice. Um, We've seen Albert before, very quotable. Albert St. George was the first chemist to extract vitamin C. Um, although orange juice and lemon juice have high levels of ascorbic acid vitamin C, they contain sugars that make purification extremely difficult. St. George, George solved the problem by making use of the imag imaginative use of the local speciality paprika, living in a town which is said to be the paprika capital of the world. One night, St. George recalled, his wife had served him fresh red paprika for supper. As he wrote in his autobiography, I didn't feel like eating it, so I thought of a way out. Suddenly it occurred to me there's one plant that I never tested, so I took it to the library. And by about midnight, I knew I had a treasure chest full of vitamin C. Within several weeks, St. George had produced three pounds, that's about a kilo and a half, of pure crystalline ascorbic acid, enough to show... When fed, for example, the vitamin C deficient guinea pigs, that the acid was equivalent to vitamin C and is in fact the same substance. Um, as a chemistry student, I was familiar with the Howarth projection of uh, cyclic monosaccharides, which you will have uh, covered, I'm sure, in biochemistry. Howarth established the correct structure of vitamin C, which he named hexauronic acid because it contains six, six carbon atoms, and later ascorbic acid. This was the first synthesis of any vitamin. And he won a Nobel Prize in 1937 for it. So how much do we need? Um, 40 milligrams a year, account the food standards agency. Uh, potatoes contain relatively modest amounts of vitamin C. We eat them a lot, or at least, or at least we used to historically. I'm not sure it's still, still this case these days. So we may have to have a look at it at some point. Uh, muscle meats and cereals do not contain significant amounts of vitamin C. An average orange or kiwi fruit contains about 50 milligrams. Go back to potatoes. You probably need two to three average sized potatoes to get the RDA, uh, which historically probably wasn't uh, that unusual. Probably a bit more unusual these days. Uh, vitamin C is excreted via the kidneys. Uh, absorption may be reduced, as we mentioned, by factors such as stress, smoking or colds. Uh, although it is often said that vitamin C can't be stored, if taken in large quantities, a reservoir may develop uh, to some extent. And under, even, even under deficiency conditions, this pool of the vitamin may prevent scurvy for up to three months. But after that, you're on your own. Um, scurvy is only rarely seen and mostly in alcoholics. And there's an example on the next page. But see also this recent report of a child in Wales dying from scurvy. Uh, and there's an example of a, uh, a an emergency admission, as we mentioned before. One of the issues is that doctors have very rarely seen scurvy, so it's quite difficult to diagnose. So, an interesting and very open question. If we need it, why don't we make it? Uh, plants make it. Uh, vitamin C is essential to plants. It functions as a major redox buffer, uh, more on this when we talk about antioxidants, and as a cofactor for enzymes, that is a Another the chemical which is required to make an enzyme work. It's involved in re regulating photosynthesis, hormone, hormone biosynthesis, re regenerating other antioxidants, there's many other roles in plants. Um, as mentioned earlier on, uh, our problems are associated with loss of the enzyme GULO, uh, the enzyme that catalyzes the last step of the conversion into ascorbic acid. Um, there's a couple of words there which we should define. Pseudogenes are genomic DNA substances, sequences, I beg your pardon, similar to normal genes but non-functional, regarded the distant relatives of functional genes. Uh, so we have pseudogenes for Gullo, indicating that he used to be functional in our genome once but isn't now. Uh, so why? Uh, humanity has changed considerably during our evolutionary history. Changes usually happen because they confer some selective advantage on us. Uh, here's some uh, theories. Um, 
which we'll go through one at a time. Uh, hypotheses is actually probably a better word because they aren't particularly testable in many cases. And some of them, particularly the last one, is, would be pretty hard to test. Uh, modern humans arose in Africa between a quarter of a million and 300,000 years ago and then raided into Europe and Asia. The situation then becomes quite complex with several human species, including the Neanderthals, the Denisovians, and the oldest humans, Homo antecessor, which is from Spain, uh, living at the same time as Homo sapiens. Um, so there's, there's, there's quite a lot of evidence associated, particularly with the Neanderthals, uh, on, on their biochemistry in relationship to human biochemistry. Um, one hypothesis is that climate change in Africa drove our, drove our hominid ancestors, such as the Australopithecines shown here, out of the shrinking forest and into the growing plains. This was possibly associated with a change in diet, and perhaps an increase in the amount of fruit and vegetables in our diet. The assumption is that, with vitamin C being very abundant in the diet, selective pressure favoured the loss of this quite complex biochemical pathway in humans, or hominids to be more correct. Saved a bit of energy. Um, you may recall this slide from an early lecture. Note how much more of a range of colours we can see compared to our monkey cousins, who tended not to radiate on the plains, rather retain their forest habitats. As I mentioned a, a slide or so ago, and this may well have helped us to identify fruit and vegetables from a you know, reasonable distance away. Uh, it's a hypothesis. Uh, this is a very famous chemist, Linus Pauling, commenting on the loss of the Gullo gene. Uh, rearranging what I've just said, basically. Uh, it's very sad that Powling is perhaps ge more generally known these days for his over-enthusiastic advocacy of vitamin C for roles that have still not been established. What he should be celebrated for is the work uniting traditional chemistry with quantum mechanics, summarised in his book on the nature of the chemical bond. All the work you've covered on atomic and molecular orbitals and bonds derives from this work done by Powling and other key fig figures, including Erwin Schrodinger. Uh, so that's what we should be celebrated for. Yeah, the nature of a chemical bond. Uh, as mentioned, yeah, yeah, so Powling was the only person ever to receive two unshared Nobel Prizes, one for chemistry, for the work associated with on the nature of the chemical bond, and later the Peace Prize for his campaign against nuclear weapons. Uh, there's another hypothesis, uh, which was developed a few years ago, but doesn't seem to have gone much further. Um, this argues that the loss of this biosynthetic ability has allowed vitamin C to act as a fertility factor in primates, societies, ultimately including us. It is argued that the requirement for vitamin C increases with age. So in terms of food shortages, the older members of society suffer higher mortality than the younger. Uh, I'm not going to draw any current parallels with this. This reduces the median age of the population that was younger and most fertile members, so it enables the population to regrow rapidly when food resources are restored. This is perhaps supported by the observation that the older you get, the more vitamin C you need. Um, there are higher amounts for young children, but this may be evolutionary in evolutionary terms to provide a margin of safety um, in terms of sh short shortages of vitamin C in the diet. Uh, here's some evidence, a uh, link through, there's a, a link through in the notes certainly, uh, and I want you to have a look at this data before next week for a couple of reasons. Uh, so here's an exercise, uh, tables are one thing, graphs are always better, uh, on the, uh, so on the basis of the graph is normally more easily comprehensible than the table of numbers, here's some activities for you to do, do. plot a suitable graph. And have a think about the requirements of groups such as smokers and pregnant women, what advice would you give them? Okay, and finally, I like this one, exploding stars. Um, boom. A gamma ray burst are the strongest and brightest explosions in the universe, thought to be generated during the formation of black holes. Although they last mere seconds, gamma ray bursts produce as much energy as the sun will admit during its entire 10 billion year existence. Uh, so a lot of energy. Um, and, and there is a theory that it, we were this planet was bathed in the a gamma ray burst and produced a, a new mutation that deleted the gene concerned. I say a theory, hypothesis, and perhaps very tentative hypothesis would be a better way of saying this. An obvious problem with this hypothesis is it seems to have only affected presumably a single common ancestor of the modern species that can't make vitamin C. Other affected species may have gone extinct, of course. 
Another problem is that we can't test this experimentally. GRBs have been observed in distant gal galaxies, which is just as well. If one were happening on our galaxy, and particularly if we're close enough, we would have no warning until the extinction-level extinction gamma ray burst arrived, and then we would not be having this conversation. Okay, so there we are on that happy note.